Hello and a warm welcome to this week's Virtual Family Church. It's great to have you with us this morning. My name's Matt and I'm a church worker for Holy Trinity Gateshead. Now, I know it's still only November, but today is actually the first Sunday of Advent this year. And we have a video later on to help us think about that. We're also going to be returning to our sermon series in Acts as Rod speaks to us from Acts chapter 5. And we will also sing together from, with songs from the Keswick Convention, as well as a fun one for the kids by Colin Buchanan. If you've not got one already, do go and get a Bible so you're ready to go. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and say hi to each other on that live chat. But first, let's start with our prayer to our loving Heavenly Father. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together this morning. And I pray that as you speak to us from your word and we sing great truths of your gospel, that you'd be working in us to change us more like your son each day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now it's time for our first song, and as we are watching this together, we can rejoice and sing praises to our King as his people. For his perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease. And what an encouragement it was to hear that. Because our God doesn't change and he is so gracious to us, his people. Yet we still sin. We do not do what we should and we do the things we shouldn't. Yet God is merciful and through his son Jesus we can know that we are made right with God. We are forgiven. 
But as I said, we do still sin. And so it is right that we say sorry to God for the ways we go against him. And let me do that for us now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are sorry for when we do not live the way you want us to, and we say no to your ways. Thank you for sending your Son to become flesh, and that we can know we forgiveness and life through him. Help us to live in accordance with your will each day. In Jesus' name. Amen. What a joy to know we do have a merciful God who sent his own son to take the punishment we deserve so we can be certain of forgiveness and have life in him. Now, in our children's talks, we have been looking at who Jesus says he is with his I am statements. And Andy Gorn is going to continue that for us now. Hi, we're going to find out today about another of the amazing things that Jesus says about himself. And this one is huge, maybe the biggest of the lot, because it's all about life and death. Because Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That is an outrageous promise. How can Jesus say that about himself? And is he telling the truth? Well, I want us to imagine that this is life and that door over there is death. So at the moment, you and I are in life and we don't want us or anyone else to go through that door. Now, let's see what happened when Jesus made that outrageous promise. Jesus had some close friends called Mary, Martha and Lazarus. And they were brothers and sisters and they lived in a village called Bethany. And Jesus had obviously spent a lot of time with them. So here they are in life in Bethany. And one day Jesus got a very sad message to tell him that Lazarus was ill. Very, very ill. Now you might think that Jesus dropped everything and got to Bethany as quickly as he could. But he didn't. He waited there another two days. Why? Did he think that there was a really good doctor in Bethany who'd give Lazarus just the right medicine to make him better? No. You see, Jesus knew that he was going to do something that would prove to people who he really is. Here's what he said. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son, that's him, Jesus, may be glorified through it. But by the time they did start walking to Bethany, Lazarus had died. So let's wrap Lazarus in cloths like they did in those days and put him through the door. Looks like you're too late, Jesus. But Jesus says something very strange. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. So to us and his sisters, it's obvious that Lazarus's body has stopped working. He's died. But to Jesus, it's more like he's asleep. And sleep is not the end, is it? We, we wake up from sleep. So Lazarus has died, but because of Jesus, it's not the end for Lazarus. Now, it took four days for Jesus and the disciples to get to Bethany, by which time Lazarus had been dead and buried in that tomb for four whole days. Martha came out to meet Jesus. Jesus, she said, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Well, maybe that's true. But Jesus then made that outrageous promise to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In other words, Martha, Lazarus, your brother, died believing, trusting in me, so he will live. It's a bit like this. Imagine that this rope is Lazarus's faith, his trust in Jesus. It ties him to Jesus. It joins him to Jesus. So it's like Jesus is saying, I can pull Lazarus out of death. Really? Yes because Jesus knows that he has power over even death. And we know that's true because not many weeks later, Jesus himself was arrested and nailed to the cross and died to pay the price for our forgiveness. 
They buried him in a tomb, but Jesus rose again to new life, never to die again. And hundreds of people saw him alive. Jesus beat death. With Jesus, death is not the end. Okay, so back to Lazarus. Mary also came out to see Jesus crying. And Jesus looked at her in her grief, in her deep, deep pain. And Jesus was angry. He was angry at death. He was angry at Satan. He was angry at the terrible effects of sin on us. And Jesus wept. He burst into tears. He went with them to Lazarus's tomb. It was a cave with a stone across the entrance. Take away the stone said Jesus. I mean, imagine what people thought. Martha said to him, Lord, he's been dead four days. The smell is going to be terrible. But Jesus knew how awesome is God's power through him. He prayed, asking that God would help the people watching to see and believe. And then he called Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus, come out! It's a bit of a moment, isn't it? Calling a dead guy out of a tomb. But as Mary and Martha and the friends and the family watched, a man appeared at the entrance to the tomb, wrapped in cloths around his body and his head. Lazarus, he's alive. Take off the cloths, said Jesus. Let him go. You see, Jesus proved that really dull Lazarus back from the dead and to end the effects of having been buried for four days in that tomb. He proved that his outrageous promise is true and his promise is true to anyone who puts their trust in Jesus, not just for Lazarus. So it's like the rope is still attached to Jesus and anyone can pick it up and be tied to Jesus. And we do that when we put our trust in him to rescue us from our sin and its biggest problem, death. Jesus promises to pull us through death, to be with him alive forever. When someone we love dies, it is deeply and painfully sad. But with Jesus, death is not the end. For anyone who's trusting in him, who's joined to him through their faith in him, it's more like being asleep. And that is a real and genuine hope for anyone now who's trusting in Jesus and for people who have believed in him and have died already. And that's only because of who Jesus is and what he's done, dying on the cross to pay for our forgiveness and then beating death by rising again to new life, never to die again. Look again at Jesus' outrageous promise to you. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he has gone through death and out the other side. Thank you that he has beaten death. And thank you for all that that means to those who are trusting in Jesus. In his name. Amen. Now let's sing our next song together.
Now is our time. We come to speak to our Heavenly Father as we pray to him. And this morning we'll do this again in two ways. First, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together, and the words will be on your screen. Then Andrew from Holy Trinity is going to continue our prayers this morning. So do join me in praying as Jesus taught us how, saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Dear Father God, during these times of uncertainty and great difficulty for many, by your Spirit, help us to realise, remember, and rejoice that you do rule over earth and heaven and that your kingdom will never fail. We pray for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. We know that for many of them, the pandemic has hit them hard. Not being able to meet together, loss of work and loss of loved ones. We pray that they would remain resolute in their trust of you, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. We pray for our global leaders. Help us to remember that you have put them in the positions of authority that they are in. And we pray that they would turn to you for wisdom in how to govern and lead. In England, we pray that our leaders will allow for churches to open for services again as soon as possible. Lord, we long to be able to be in the same room singing, praying and hearing from your word. Help us to be patient in this and to be thankful for the technology that enables us to stay connected during this time. As Christmas approaches, we pray for the upcoming Christmas events, including the Women's Online Christmas Craft Evening on the 3rd of December and the Virtual Christmas Cracker taking place on the 5th of December. Lord, we thank you for those involved in organising and facilitating these events. Help us to be bold in our invitations to friends, family and work colleagues to these events. We thank you for Rod and the staff team at Holy Trinity. We pray for their ongoing wisdom and faithful leadership, particularly during this challenging time. And Lord, help us to remember that each day of lockdown and isolation is one day closer to Christ's return and our eternal home. And with the words at the beginning of Hebrews 12 in mind, let us not lose heart, but to run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Sovereign Father, we bring these prayers before you by your Spirit, in the name of Christ Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. We've got another song now. This is a really fun song from Colin Buchanan about a super saviour. But it's not just fun for the kids, but for all of us, and a great reminder about Jesus. Save the day, take our sins away. Who can rescue us with mighty power? Super Savior to the rescue. Super Savior, mighty to save. Look, look, here comes Jesus up, up, and out of the grave. Super Savior to the rescue. Super Savior. Crusher, sin smasher, who's the mighty super savior? Jesus, he's a death crusher, sin smasher, who's the mighty super savior? Jesus. Who can 
save the day Take our sins away Who can rescue us with mighty I mentioned earlier that today is the first Sunday of Advent, a time we look forward to the return of Jesus and we prepare to celebrate the Son of God taken on flesh. We now have a video of a beautiful retelling of that nativity story to help us think about Christmas and how God has a welcome for all people. After that, Joe will be reading the next section of Acts for us. I know it's no one's fault, it's no one's fault that someone is born with a, with a disability, but then you still feel like, but why did this happen to us? Welcome to all of you. Please take a seat. We want to now share a nativity treat. This story of Christmas, we tell it in rhyme. Some actors have lines. Why are some of us mime? I was overwhelmed with grief um, at the loss. I thought a beautiful baby has got Down syndrome and it's such a disaster. Meanwhile, great Caesar, Augustus in Rome, made a decree, return to your home. For Joseph, this ruling meant Bethlehem town. So they rode on their donkey all the way down. God didn't give me a straightforward answer of why this happened. It just took time for me to realize God's answer was, wasn't so much that it was wrong with Levi as much as there was something wrong with the way I was thinking. Mary was speechless. She didn't know how these things could have happened, but still she bowed. I think of Mary, of all she goes through. It's not her plan, it's God's plan. She just goes with it. She's humble, she's calm, she's reassured by the fact that everything's going to be okay. For he has remembered me, his lowly servant. From now on, all the people will call me happy. He has brought down mighty king from the throne and lift up the lowly. What we learned um, was that God was with us. God suffered with us and, um, and he gave us the most beautiful child and there was no reason for me to grieve or compare her or you know um you know feel sorry for her you know in my old view before she taught me i thought she would lack she's not lacking so gathered around that we baby boy all people are welcome to know heaven's joy from angels to donkeys from shepherds to king the little lord jesus God's welcome he brings. He came to our darkness from heaven above. He stooped to the crib and the cross out of love. He shared in our weakness and weakness and mess, and still he embraced us nevertheless. If you're feeling rejected, excluded a stranger, remember the one who came down to the manger.
Today's reading is taken from Acts chapter 5 verses 12 to 26. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple of the guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. And now, in a moment, Rod is going to share with us from what we've just heard there. So that means now's the time to print out the worksheets for children and young people if you need them. And you can find a link right under the player. You might find it helpful to grab your Bible so you can follow along with the whole passage. And feel free to pause if you need to. Meanwhile, we're going to sing of the certain hope we have in Christ.
Well, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, please be with us now as we come to you to try and understand your word. Please work in us by your Holy Spirit so we would understand it rightly. And please move us so we'll be changed by it to do what is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are some people who are so concerned with how other people think about them that they'll do almost anything to avoid losing face. The problem being that it almost always ends up in them looking a bigger fool in the end. Do you know anyone like that? They're so wrapped up in their own reputation, they take themselves way too seriously. And in the end, it makes them a huge target for mockery. I could perhaps mention some popular politicians at this point, but it might be safer just to leave that one where it is. Let's pick a less political example. Let me pick on deluded reality TV wannabes. One of the reasons I went off reality TV was the delight they seemed to take in skewering the insecure. Think of a show like The X Factor. In the first few weeks of a new series, the show delighted to expose the delusions of people who came to put themselves on the show. These poor saps, they'd be encouraged to talk up their talent. You know, who do you think you could be? I could be the next Mariah Carey or Adele or Celine Dion. But then they'd sing. And we would quickly discover that they were much more like a tomcat screeching in the back alley than like one of those famous singers. And sometimes the delusion would run so deep that even after being rejected, they would refuse to believe it. They'd say, oh, the judges don't know talent when they see it. I'll be back, I'll prove you all wrong. They're so desperate to be famous, to be loved, to impress the world, that they end up making themselves a laughing stock. Well, why are we talking about this? Well, in our passage this morning, we see a bunch of fools making themselves ridiculous out of fear of what others thought of them. And we see how fear of God releases us from that fear of man. We're going to see this through the way that that God really makes it obvious that he is with the early church. But the Sanhedrin just wouldn't see what was obvious to everyone else because they were afraid of people. And then we'll see how the early church was released from the fear of men by a right fear of God. So we're going to make three points this morning. Firstly, God is clearly with his church. Secondly, fighting God for fear of men. And thirdly, fear of God conquers fear of man. Let's start with point one. God clearly was with his church. Have a look with me at verse 12. So look, Acts chapter 5, verse 12. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. (laughs) Could it be more obvious that God is in this? The apostles are performing so many miraculous healings that people are literally laying the sick out in the streets in hopes that they might be healed by the apostles as they just walked past. And it was working. Now, we've heard one outstanding miracle in these chapters. Back in chapter 3, that paralyzed man who was healed by Peter and John at the temple. But he was far from the only one. All the disciples had to do, it seems, was to walk down the road for people to be healed. Now, it's easy for us just to skip over these verses, but don't. Just stop for a moment. Jesus said his followers would do even greater miracles than he did. That's John 14, verse 12. Now, Jesus healed a woman who simply touched the hem of his cloak. And it seems it was like that for the disciples too. Wherever they went, amazing things happened. Healings multiplied. People came from far and wide. And no matter how many people showed up, no matter how ill they were, no matter how long they'd been ill, God healed them all. I mean, it's astonishing. And remember, there were no hospitals back then, precious little medicine either. A fever could be life-threatening. A broken bone could be crippling. There would have been far more people suffering with disease and disability back then than today. But all of them, everyone who came, was healed. We have to see God at work here. We have to see God at work here because God makes it obvious. He makes it obvious because we're so slow to believe. He makes it as obvious as can be. These things are happening at the hand of God. Because Jesus is God's promised saviour. So so God knew it wouldn't be easy for the people who put Jesus to death to turn to him in repentance. So God made it so clear he was with the church. Jesus really had risen. Jesus was truly Lord. They could really turn turn to him and be forgiven. So you might think of God as like a, a master artist. When we look at the master's work, it's instantly recognisable. And so those really great artists who, who move things forward, well, they develop their own characteristic style, don't they? Go into the National Art Gallery and look, 
And even an art ignoramus like me can see we're looking at the work of masters of their craft. It's obvious. And I mean, I could probably even pick a Monet from a Van Gogh or a, a Da Vinci, maybe. <laughs> but even though these guys all have their own style, even though their work is instantly recognisable, the artist always signs his or her name on the canvas. They know they'll be counterfeits, so they make it clear, they make it obvious, so we can know this is their work, so they get the credit. Well, look at the New Testament church. It's got God's signature all over it. This is God's characteristic style. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. He's restoring creation to its original glory. He's undoing the works of the evil one, pushing back death and darkness and bringing life and light into the world. We could say it's got Jesus' fingerprints all over it. This is his signature work. These are the things that only God can do. God is here. God is at work. See, God makes it obvious. But not everyone will see it. Not everyone will admit it. The second point is fighting God for fear of men. And we're talking about the Sanhedrin here. And if ever we wanted proof that God has a sense of humour, surely this passage is it. The high priest and his associates, who are Sadducees and deny the resurrection and the existence of angels, they try and stop the apostles from preaching to the people about Jesus' resurrection by locking them up. So during the night, God sends, you know it, an angel who lets them out of prison without disturbing the guards and commands them to stand in the most public place in Jerusalem and preach the very things the Sanhedrin are trying to suppress. So the next morning when the Sanhedrin meets to stop them preaching, they're nowhere to be found. And we get this comedy scene of the full Sanhedrin meeting in all their pomp and all the full cohort of guards standing in their places and all the doors securely locked, but no prisoners inside. And the people they're trying to silence, they're off preaching. And you've got to love this dozy character who tops it all off in verse 25. He comes in and he finds them all scratching their heads, wondering where the apostles are. And he says, oh, well, they're in the temple courts teaching the people. Seems he didn't even stop to think about trying to stop them. <laughs> it's a comedy of errors from, from one end to the other. The Sanhedrin are making utter fools of themselves. And at the end of the chapter, one of their numbers sums it up like this in, in verse 35. He says, uh, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. And then he goes on and gives them a little history lesson of some false messiahs in recent times who died and their work came to nothing. And then he goes on in verse 38. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, you will fail. But if it is from God, you'll not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. I'll talk about trying to shut the barn door after the horses bolted. He needed to say this before they executed Jesus, didn't he? Or even earlier, as they kept bumping heads with Jesus as he preached and taught. See, as it is, he suggests there's a chance they might at some point in the future find themselves fighting against God. Well, what's he thinking they've been doing up till now? And this argument that he makes, false messiahs fail in time, so just wait and see if this one's false or not. Wait and see? Wait, isn't there some way we could work it out? Couldn't we maybe look for some signs that God was in it, some way to judge if it was from God or from men? I mean, what are they waiting for? A great big illuminated sign above Jesus saying, this is the one? Well, didn't they actually hear God's voice from heaven saying, this is the one, listen to him? Didn't they see him feeding the people in the wilderness, see him raising the dead and healing the sick, casting out demons, teaching with authority? Didn't the eyewitnesses say he rose from the dead? Wasn't God even now healing the sick through his disciples? What more do they need? See, if this isn't fighting against God, then what is it? And just to sharpen this up for us, have a look at verse 20. Verse 20. The angel tells Peter and the apostles to go out and to preach. What does he say to them? He says, verse 20, Go and stand in the temple courts and tell the people what the full message of this new life. See, the angel releases captives to go and preach good news. What's the Sanhedrin doing? They're imprisoning the messengers to try and silence the good news. Their response to this gospel message of life that Peter preaches, well, it says it all. After Peter preaches this message of forgiveness and salvation, verse 33, verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. So it couldn't be more stark, could it? Jesus brings life, they bring death. Jesus proclaims good news of release for the captives. They want to lock that message up, stamp it out, and kill it. 
they're fighting against God, all right. There's no maybes about it. It's not a future possibility. They are right in the middle of it. By the end of this chapter, they're whipping God's messengers to within an inch of their lives. And soon they'll be rounding them up and executing them, hounding the messengers out of town and chasing the message all around the Middle East and Europe, desperate to shut it down. So why would they do this? There's a really revealing line in the middle of the proceedings when they finally get the apostles into the Sanhedrin. It's verse 28. And this is essentially the charge that they bring against the apostles. Have a read of it with me. Verse 28. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty for this man's blood. Do you see what they're upset about? There's two things here, isn't there? Firstly, the, the apostles defied a direct order. But behind that, the real problem? Well, the real problem is they're ruining the Sanhedrin's reputation. They're determined to make them guilty of Jesus' blood. Now, never mind they were guilty of his blood. I mean, remember in Matthew 27, when Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified, they literally said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. So they were guilty. What was the problem? Well, the problem was they were being bowed mouthed. Their reputation was everything for them. They couldn't have someone going around saying they'd done something wrong. See, this is what we've seen from Israel's leaders throughout the Gospels. They're hypocrites. They're much more concerned about what others think of them or say about them than what's actually true. In John 12, 46, it actually says they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And I think that just sums it up, doesn't it? They were so concerned about what people thought of them that they would make themselves God's enemies in order to preserve their precious reputation, even killing God's own son. So how do we escape the trap that they were caught in? Well, Peter makes it clear in the very next verse. Verse 29, his response, we must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. See, a proper, healthy, functioning fear of God delivered them from the fear of men. And this is our third point. Fear of God conquers fear of men. See, I think this is where our passage this week connects with the passage from last week. Now, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Why did Luke include the story of Ananias and Sapphira? I mean, it's so confronting. It's so negative. And now we hear that the disciples are doing all kinds of miracles of healing. But Luke doesn't have time to tell us about that. What's he doing? Telling us about God's, telling us about God's judgment, but not telling us about all the good stuff. I mean, we'd like to hear more about those miracles, wouldn't we? All those people coming from all over being healed, people lining the streets with the sick, just hoping that Peter's shadow might fix them, and they're healed. I mean, yes, please, another chapter of that. They'll bring in the crowds. That'll impress your readers, Luke. But church members dying for lying to God, not really a selling point. Yet Luke barely summarizes the miracles. In 243, he said that the apostles were doing many signs and wonders. And here in chapter 5, there's just these three little verses. Why not spend more time on those things? Why leave out the miracles that make Jesus look so good to make room for that one moment of failure in the New Testament church, especially when it's off-putting. Why? Well, I think this is the answer. Remember how the passage finished last week? Chapter 5, verse 11 said, Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Great fear seized them. The fear of God fell on his people. Sounds negative, doesn't it? But actually it's not. It's healthy fear that treats God rightly. See, the, the problem is when we treat God lightly, that's what gets us in trouble. Just like a healthy fear of electricity keeps us safe while carelessness leads to electrocution. electrocution. The disciples learnt to fear God, learnt just how serious his judgment could be, learnt just how seriously he took this whole giving our whole lives over to him thing, very seriously, with absolute seriousness. And so now they come against a group of immensely powerful men and they face the threat of pain and public shaming and for most of us, that's time to crumble, isn't it? That's time to start figuring out how to cut our losses, you know, time to make a deal, or compromise a little, soften the message, live to fight another day. But the apostles, they're working on a different set of equations, aren't they? They know God's opinion counts much more than any human court. They know that suffering for Jesus is valuable in God's sight, but hypocrisy is appalling in his sight. Their sense of the value of things has just been radically recalibrated. And now they have no fear of these men, however powerful they might be. And they care very little if they're humiliated before the crowds, or even if they're hurt. In fact, they rejoice to be counted worthy of suffering for the sake of Jesus' name. They rejoice. 
See, they could stand in front of the Sanhedrin and see the wealth and the privilege and the power and the cruelty without once being intimidated because they know a higher court. And the apostles have been pointing out again and again in these early chapters of Acts that the Sanhedrin's judgments have been consistently reversed by God. You know, you rejected Jesus, you condemned him, you handed him over to be killed, but God reversed the verdict. God raised Jesus, God seated him in the highest throne. And on this very day, the apostles have experienced that reversal for themselves, haven't they? The Sanhedrin locked them up to silence them, but God reversed it. God released them from the cells and God told them not to be silent, but to preach. <laughs> See, knowing God's verdict over them, well, the Sanhedrin's pronouncements were never going to matter all that much, were they? As Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. So what's this section of Acts about? What are we supposed to learn? What are we supposed to do, having read it? I think what we're seeing here is the fear of God put into practice in the lives of people. The apostles simply aren't afraid anymore, not of men anyway. They can preach boldly. They can defy God's enemies without fear. They can even rejoice when they suffer for God's name because they know God's verdict and they fear God, not anyone else. They proclaim life and they live. They truly live. And on the other hand, we're seeing the fear of men and how it makes fools of us. I mean, this is Sanhedrin. They are the biggest gathering of fools since, well, since Pharaoh refused to let Israel go and destroyed Egypt in the process, aren't they? They double down on the bad decision to reject Jesus. And until here they are, punishing miracles of healing, confirming themselves as God's enemies. They oppose the message of life. They pretend to be religious, but they suppress the truth. And ultimately, they're governed by rage and violent anger. They want to kill the messengers. And so again, it's like Luke saying, well, over to you. Do you want to be fools like the Sanhedrin? Deny what's as obvious as the nose in your face and carry on as God's enemy? Or do you want to be free from fear of man? Free from foolishness? Free to speak the truth? Free to truly live? Well, where are you at this morning? Do you know the fear of the Lord? In your heart, which way around is it? Are people big and, and God small? Or does God dominate your vision so that everything else is tiny. Can I suggest the best place to be is to embrace the fear of God and to be freed from the fear of everything else. If we can do that, we'll be truly free. So let's pursue fear of God in company with his people. Let's give him the honour and the glory that he deserves. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us the privilege of calling you Father and indeed of being your children. Being your children, please help us to see you as you are, that we might gain a right, holy fear of you and reverence you as you are. And so please would you release us from all other fears that bind us so we can be free to serve you and to really live free from fear, delighting in all that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I think that's the end of our time together this morning. It's been great to have you with us. But as we finish, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for Jesus and that we can know salvation through him. And help us remember all these truths we've heard this morning. And as we go about our week, that they'll be affecting us and changing us and helping us to be more like your son this week. In Jesus' name, amen. I do hope to see you next week. You can stay on Clayton TV for Jesmond Parish Church morning service now, or you might like to come back this evening at 6.30 for Jesmond's evening service. But if you're from Holy Trinity, do stay on for a few notices for this week, and then we can join together on our Zoom catch-up after. Apart from that, that's all for this morning, and I'll see you next week. Hi ATG, a few notices for us this week. Explorers is on this afternoon at 4.30pm. Do check the website for more details. Toddlers, Jam, Ark and Revive are on as normal, so chat to your leaders or again see the website. This Wednesday is our monthly prayer meeting, so there won't be any home groups, but it'd be great to have as many of us there as we pray to our, uh, together as a church family. Just a reminder that the Women's Online Christmas Craft Evening is on this Thursday. Booking for that is now closed but there may be a couple of spares available, so do chat to Leslie for more details. 
On Saturday the 5th of December we have our virtual Christmas cracker. A fun morning with singing, nativity story, activities and crafts. Check our website for more information and get booked as booking closes on Wednesday. And lastly, on Wednesday the 16th of December, in the evening we are having our Christmas festivities. Afternoon tea selection at home and a Christmas quiz. Again, check the website for more information on how to book your food. That's all from me. I'll see you on Zoom in a moment.